All right, good morning, everyone. So happy to be back here to welcome you to the SBRB seminar series. Uh, we've ran this series since just after the founding of the Social and Behavioral Research Branch, and we gather twice a year to recognize and bring to NIH leaders at the intersection of genomics and society. Uh, really pleased to be rebooting this seminar series after the pandemic um, and to welcome our branch chief, Laura Cayley, in order to welcome um, our featured speaker. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Susan, for passing the mic. Um, and I want to also say good morning. It's so nice to see everyone here in person. So thank you for coming out on this uh, drizzly day uh, to Building 50 um, to hear um, from our esteemed colleague, uh, Anita Kinney. And I really want to say that uh, Anita is a wonderful uh, researcher and friend. I've known Anita since I uh, did my postdoctoral research at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where Anita was a nurse practitioner and also um, doing her doctorate. Um, so uh, Dr. Kinney Erner earned her doctorate in epidemiology with a minor in behavioral science from the University of Texas um, uh, School of Public Health in Houston. And then after she completed her doctorate, she uh, went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship uh, under an NCI-funded uh, R25T at um, the Lindberger Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Dr. Kinney is currently a distinguished faculty member at Rutgers University. Um, she holds a lot of um, positions there. She's a professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology, the director of the Cancer or Center for Cancer Health Equity in the School of Public Health, the associate director for Cancer Health Equity and Engagement at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, and the director of Screen NJ, which is a statewide cancer prevention and screening program in New Jersey. Dr. Kinney's uh, research program focuses on cancer prevention and control, where she has a particular emphasis on the genetic, behavioral, and environmental factors that influence cancer risk and outcomes. Um, she really uses a transdisciplinary approach in her work. Uh, Dr. Kinney has made substantial strides in advancing our understanding of how to mitigate the burden of cancer within at-risk communities. And she's engaged in several clinical trials at the moment. Not sure which of those she's gonna talk about, but just wanted to um, mention that she's also translating what she's learned into clinical practice, which I think is really um, resonates with me as we try to do service through our research. Um, she is a staunch advocate for health equity and social justice. Uh, Dr. Kinney is committed to addressing disparities in cancer care and promoting um, access to quality health care for all individuals, regardless of their background and socioeconomic status. And I have to say her efforts to empower communities and promote health equity have really earned her international recognition. So today, uh, Dr. Kinney is here with us in person, and she's going to speak about developing alternative cancer care delivery models with an equity lens. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kinney to NIH. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I don't have slides, but I just remembered when you were introducing me. I knew this, but it brought it to the forefront of my mind. Um, my first uh, R01, uh, was funded by NHGRI. Uh, most of my funding um, has since come from uh, NCI. Uh, I do have a grant from NHLBI uh, looking at um, lung cancer screening, uh, decision coaching, and uh, patient uh, navigation intervention system-wide. But my first grant um, focused on, um, it was the first study of uh, um, African-American kindred, uh, large families related by blood, who carried a BRCA mutation. I was at the University of Utah. And uh, as you know, in Utah, uh, Mark Skolnick and others uh, cloned uh, BRCA1 and 2. It was patented, start myriad genetics. And this was a, uh, a population that had um, 
participated in um, the genetic epidemiology research, and my research was, and I was funded by NH, um, NIH, uh, to develop a culturally targeted uh, intervention to uh, disclose uh, genetic test results for those who wanted uh, clinically approved genetic testing, and that was quite an adventure. So I've been in the um, equity and disparities research world for a very uh, long time. I'm going to share some of um, my current research uh, with you that I thought might be relevant um, to this group in a large area of my focus. But just to set everybody on the same page, uh, promoting equity and precision cancer control uh, is a national priority. Uh, we aim to ensure that all segments of the population have access to cancer information and guideline concordant care. Representation in research matters. And in order to reduce disparities, we need to address uh, multi-level factors. And to, uh, Debbie Craig and Tua Paul and I um, published a paper years ago uh, where we outlined factors uh, to consider to address uh, disparities in translational clinical community uh, genomics. And so uh, interventions and considerations are at the individual level, interpersonal level, system level, and community and policy uh, levels. And of course, equity is important across all of those uh, levels. This uh, model is drawn from, many of you know, the so socio-ecological framework which we applied to more clinical um, genetics. I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, just for those who are trainees, uh, hereditary cancer accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of cancers caused by an inherited uh, mutation. It's typical to see a recurring pa pattern across two or three generations, but in oncology now we identify uh, cancer patients and often don't even need or use a family history. The guidelines are based on uh, characteristics uh, that we can identify in the cancer patient without knowledge uh, of family history, which has really uh, expanded uh, access in identifying uh, patients and families who are at risk for hereditary cancer. So most cancers are sporadic. Often when a cancer patient is diagnosed, they say, I don't have, I don't have cancer in my family. How did I get cancer, right? So uh, we need to explain that uh, to patients that many don't have identified genetic, uh, germline genetic risk factors. So strategies to improve access to genetic services and uh, promoting equity are, are needed. Um, genetic testing uh, can enhance prevention, screening, treatment, and cascade testing. That's a term we use uh, where we uh, can test uh, relatives of uh, patients where there's a known mutation in a family. Genetic testing has been available for over uh, 20 years. Uh, the pace of translation has been um, uh, disappointingly slow. Uh, a low uptake in cancer patients, less than 30% of cancer patients who uh, carry deleterious uh, mutation or, or meet the criteria for testing have been um, tested. And less than 10% of people with pathogenic variants, uh, that's the term where we used to use mutation, now it's PV or pathogenic variant have had germline testing. Precision medicine can improve outcomes. There's lots of data about that and, and is cost effective. However, there's many barriers to implementation. So I mentioned some of these uh, things. So I'm going to go over uh, this slide. So access issues are uh, prevalent. Uh, there are low referral rates for genetic counseling and testing. Uh, the minority of cancer patients and actually relatives are or Patients in primary care settings are um, identified as at increased risk and referred to genetic services when they meet the criteria. Uh, access issues can relate to myriad uh, uh, things, uh, including a shortage of genetic professionals in rural and community uh, settings. There are expanded indications for genetic testing in the cancer world. Uh, you know, the, the, the criteria for testing has expanded so much. It used to be really narrow and hard to follow. Now all patients, for example, with colorectal cancer are recommended to get uh, genetic testing, where in the past it was a very narrow criteria, hard physici physicians and other providers to actually know what the guidelines are and, and interpret them. And so since there's expanded guidelines, there's uh, increased demand for testing, but few, uh, not enough uh, genetic professionals. So the NCCN and ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and NCCN is the National 
a comprehensive cancer network. They issue guidelines for a variety of cancer uh, issues, including genetic testing. And so breast cancer, for example, the guidelines just expanded. They were relatively narrow before. Genetic testing for women, 45, uh, age, age 45 or less, if they were diagnosed with breast cancer, and then other ages depending on their family history. Now all women diagnosed at 65 or less are recommended to have testing. Those who have metastatic cancer, and there's other recommendations uh, as well. So cancer genetic risk assessment is a comprehensive consultation. It's a clinical service that involves the assessment of personal and family history, genetic testing when appropriate, and risk management recommendations. Pre-test genetic counseling is recommended and is still considered the standard of care. Uh, patients often need to see a genetic counselor to uh, help guide them whether or not they should be tested and help make decisions, help patients make informed decisions whether or not they should be tested. And then when test results are available, we either call it a test result disclosure session or a post-test genetic counseling uh, session. And that involves the discussion about results and their implications for the patient and their relatives. So ways to improve access to genetic testing can occur, again, at multiple uh, levels and multiple strategies can be used. Population um, traceback case, case ascertainment involves the retrospective identification of carriers of pathogenic uh, variants. Uh, Goli Samimi at NCI had coined this term traceback approach. There are many cancer patients and family members who could carry uh, deleterious pathogenic uh, variant, and they uh, have not been referred for genetic testing. So in the clinical oncology world, many more patients that are newly diagnosed have got, got tested, but that's still uh, sub, suboptimal in terms of testing rates. And there's evidence-based uh, alternative care delivery models. I did have slides, but I cut some of them out because I get so excited about um, some of the work we do. Um, there's not enough time. Uh, but Marlena, who I met with as a trainee, and uh, <clears throat> asked me about changing policy. So Mark Schwartz and I had conducted two uh, simultaneous trials. Uh, they were non-inferiority non trials. Uh, to assess whether telephone genetic counseling and testing uh, was non-inferior to in-person counseling or testing. At that time, providers would not do telephone counseling because of a variety of concerns, concerns about psychological distress. Patients wouldn't be able to make informed decisions, so the quality of decision uh, was, was a concern, and then insurance reimbursement. And those two trials, we both were involved with them, his trial related to uh, self-referred referred patients, so patients who were self or provider referred at cancer centers along the East Coast uh, got testing. And our, my study where I was a PI uh, involved recruiting patients from a statewide um, cancer registry linked to the Utah population database. So we had information, um, not only pathologically confirmed cancers, but some genealogical information that we could or could not use, right, for uh, recruiting patients. And basically our results were essentially the same. So we used proactive public health kind of recruitment, clinic-based recruitment, and we found that uh, telephone counseling was not inferior to in-person counseling, and that helped change policy in terms of health uh, third-party reimbursement. This was before COVID uh, for telephone counseling and providers and uh, clinicians uh, such as genetic counselors and oncologists and clinical geneticists uh, then started to uh, do more telephone-based counseling, thus increasing access and reach of uh, genetic services. Uh, now, um, there are a lot of digital kinds of interventions that are have and are being studied, such as uh, internet-based um, uh, communications, websites, DVDs, um, other strategies. And many genetic testing companies are using chatbots, uh, and they haven't been um, studied and they haven't been studied in underserved uh, populations. So I'll talk a little bit about our work in that um, area. And then using non-genetics providers to uh, uh, do some genetic education to help facilitate case identification and access to genetic services. So I'm gonna talk about the GRACE project um, first. And so uh, the GRACE uh, project uh, recruited uh, women from 
uh, three uh, statewide cancer registries. I was living in New Mexico at the start of the study, so we were recruiting uh, women um, from uh, Colorado and Utah and using a cancer registry approach to identify them. And then we uh, randomized them to uh, three arms. They were breast and ovarian cancer survivors who had not had genetic counseling or testing, and they um, <clears throat> could be getting care uh, anywhere. So it wasn't in one integrated kind of health system where a lot of my research uh, currently takes place. And they uh, ranged uh, in terms of uh, years of diagnosis. We went back even 20 years and could ascertain them. And they were randomized to usual care, which is treatment as usual, targeted print intervention, public health approach, increasing awareness, education. So they received a mailed uh, educational brochure, brochure about hereditary cancer, genetic risk assessment, and then information about cancer genetic services in their area. So we had um, tailored that targeted print for geographic areas. So there were links to uh, and phone numbers so they could access genetic uh, services. And then the third arm got randomized to telephone counseling and navigation. We used a multi-component tailored intervention. So we tailored the intervention according to the patient's um, health beliefs and their barriers to care. So the genetic counselors had a lot of information before they, uh, or it wasn't a genetic counselor actually, it was a decision coach, which I'll get to, uh, before they got to uh, the educational session. And so then we sent the brochure uh, in advance of the session and we sent uh, um, some visual aids because good communication involves visual aids to enhance uh, knowledge and hopefully comprehension of uh, genetic information. Instead of using genetic counselors, we used trained decision coaches and the decision coaches were community health educators trained in motivational interviewing. For those of you uh, who are, don't know what motivational interviewing is, it's a technique that uses a patient-centered approach to get patients thinking about the information that they give them, that are given to them so they can process the information. And the thought is that they um, are more likely to uh, retain the information, think about the information, and act on it. Motivational interviewing started uh, with uh, alcohol uh, abuse and then um, tobacco, and then we've trained uh, genetic counselors in another study that this study builds off of and the genetic counselors, of course, initially were resistant. This is a theory-based intervention. Why do we have to do it? You know, we use a fear management model, so it was, you know, theoretically guided where we raised awareness, we raised emotions, because we know that from a strong body of behavioral science literature that uh, raising um, the level of emotion uh, can get people um, to comprehend information. As long as you remedy that fear uh, level, with efficacy messages. There's something we can do about it. So we did a lot of barriers counseling, identifying barriers, and then helping patients overcome barriers. And that's why we added uh, navigation to it. But in the prior study, which is a colorectal cancer screening um, genetic risk assessment study, the genetic counselors not only were uh, resistant at first to the theory-based uh, level of the intervention, but also using motivational interviewing. And uh, they used to joke around how they were all female but one how they ended up using the motivational interviewing with their uh, friends and their uh, husbands to get them to do what they wanted them to do. So it is a motivational strategy that can be very effective that we implemented into this intervention. And so this is our fear management model. So we raise perceptions of uh, uh, risk and then response efficacy, the belief that genetic risk assessment uh, can, can, can impact in uh, outcomes and then uh, self-efficacy, so the patient's uh, belief or confidence in their ability to get genetic counseling and, and or testing, and that's where a lot of the barriers counseling comes in. So we manage fear, and we, the goal is to manage fear uh, in a positive uh, manner so that patients engage in protective motivation, which is they engage in preventive actions, take, take action, rather than uh, defense motivation. And if you don't remedy fear messages with efficacy messages, that you're in danger of sending patients down this level of defensive uh, motivation. So I mentioned we recruited patients from two registries. In the middle of the trial, I moved to, back to my home state, uh, New Jersey, for family reasons. And in Colorado and New Mexico, uh, we uh, targeted all patients, but we oversampled Hispanic uh, and uh, rural um, patients. So we had a large number uh, of Hispanic patients, 
And then in um, New Jersey, uh, we wanted to recruit more black patients, but we were complete. We were competing with an epidemiologic study focused on uh, black cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer uh, survivors. So we weren't as effective in um, recruiting more um, black patients, but that was our, our goal. But um, when you're a newbie on the block, you have to uh, stand in line, right? Uh, in, even in research. And so we had uh, patients met the NCCN criteria uh, for testing. I don't expect you to read this, this but patients uh, were randomized to the three arms, as I mentioned. They completed a one month assessment so we could assess mediating variables. Did we rate, was the intervention more effective than the targeted print or the usual care in raising risk perceptions, boosting self-efficacy, boosting response efficacy, and managing uh, fear. And then they got a six month assessment where we uh, also did a survey, but we uh, obtained um, genetic counseling and testing results and medically verified that. That was not an easy uh, thing to do because this is a population-based study. We weren't in one integrated health system. And so we recruited 641 women and uh, they uh, <clears throat> were diverse in terms of uh, ethnicity and we had about 17% um, rural uh, uh, dwellers. And notably, most of the participants did not have a family history of uh, breast or ovarian cancer or other cancers. And so the, six, the primary outcome was at six months. We also did an assessment at 12 months where we removed the cost barrier. I'm not presenting that today, but if you're interested, uh, the publication just came out in JNCI Spectrum, I think, um, this month. And we did show an effect with a, a very um, low intensity cost barrier uh, intervention at a population level. So women in usual care, a uh, very small percentage of women in usual care and the targeted print got a genetic um, counseling and or testing and only 19% in the tailored counseling and navigation arm. And although we had an amazing odds ratio, so for those of you who look at or are interested in effect sizes, our uh, odds ratio uh, ranged from 7.4 to 8.9, depending on the comparison. So for example, those in the tailored counseling and navigation arm were uh, eight times, eight point or nine times as likely as those in the usual care arm to get genetic counseling and or testing. That's a huge odds ratio, but then if you look back, 20%, about 20% got uh, counseling and or testing. We thought we could move the needle more. Um, interestingly, several of my colleagues have done studies in um, clinic settings using different types of interventions. It could be a DVD, it could be a health coaching kind of intervention. And they get about the same percentage of women uh, or women and men, depending on the study, um, get counseling or testing. So it's really hard to move that needle. And so I think we need to find better ways to get more people um, tested. We're beyond you know, making, um, making it sound like, oh, this is bad, this you know, could be bad. And in the old days when I started this research, it was uh, very non-directive counseling. And so, as you know, when you, most people go to the doctor, you take your parents to a doctor, grandparents, they, they want a little more direction from a provider, and that's, that's where we've uh, moved for the most part. What are the barriers? So lack of provider recommendation was the biggest barrier to genetic counseling, cost concerns, and then competing uh, life concerns. And then genetic testing barriers were cost concerns, concern about adverse psychological um, outcomes, and some people just don't want to know. There are people out there that don't want to know. So we have to respect that. And then in behavioral um, research, we like to understand the mechanisms underlying the effect of our intervention. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, with this, but we did a, a media, mediation um, analysis. So we wanted to see if we, our intervention did raise uh, risk perceptions, self-efficacy, response efficacy, and uh, knowledge of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And the intervention actually did um, impact these intermediate outcomes or uh, mediators. This helps us to understand how this intervention work, worked and then help us design future um, interventions. And that's published in um, Annals of Behavioral Medicine. And then I'm gonna talk about um, some alternative care delivery models. So I just presented a population based approach where we identified 
candidates for genetic counseling or testing at the population level. I don't have a, I didn't add a slide. We did look at um, the impact of the GRACE intervention on uh, literacy level, um, ethnicity. We couldn't with race um, because we had too few black persons, but we were very interested in that. And as you see my research moving forward. Um, and the intervention, the tele, tele, telecounseling intervention had the same effect across literacy level, years since diagnosis. It worked better for those who didn't have a family history, not surprisingly, because those were more, um, learned more about the study and were informed that they may be at um, hereditary cancer risk. And Hispanic women actually responded a little bit better than non-Hispanic women. And we did offer the intervention in Espanol and Spanish. So we need alternative delivery models in clinical practice. So there's a comp complex interplay between lack of awareness, underestimating, underestimation of the personal and familial rel relevance of testing. There's still people out there who think like, oh, I don't need to for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. I only have sons. I don't need to be attested because they're not at risk. Obviously, they are at risk. So there's a lot of misperceptions. There's low referral rates. Uh, patients aren't being referred to the services. There's implicit bias and socio-cultural, individual, interpersonal level, and individual system level factors. So I mentioned the increased demand, decreased cost with increasing genetic testing uh, indications, decreased supply of professionals. So the standard approach of referral to pretest counseling is a common barrier. For patients who do get concerned, a minority of patients, maybe 20%, end up going to a genetics clinic. And the barrier is even more profound for black cancer patients. We know that. The evidence, <clears throat> traditional, comprehensive, educationally focused pretest counseling does not meet the needs of many survivors, cancer survivors, especially underserved minorities and those in lower socioeconomic strata. So we need new models of genome-based care that are responsive to community needs, improve access, don't overburden scarce genetic counseling, clinical genetics resources, and do not widen existing disparities. So uh, I was uh, interested to learn about uh, patients and community perceptions about using digital um, interventions to increase access uh, to genetic services, increase awareness, empower patients, and um, for those who choose to get testing, get them uh, testing, the care that they want. So we conducted focus groups, about 53 uh, people, uh, we did three focus groups with mutation carriers. We did two focus groups with uh, black and Hispanic uh, cancer patients, and then two additional focus groups with black and Hispanic spouses and relatives. We got lots of information, great discussion. Uh, Marlena this morning uh, asked me about community-engaged research, how I got into it. I recommend it for everybody that's doing um, research and is not embedded in a, in a community or with uh, patients. Uh, if you don't do it, you're less likely to have an effective intervention, and you're less likely to engage the communities that you intend to engage. So we learned a lot about family communication issues. We learned um, a lot about chatbots because we were interested in, um, in exploring chatbots, especially since genetic counseling company, testing companies are using them. They're being used to, as navigators in health systems. Why not use it in, you know, and test it, right? So there was an enthusiastic response to chatbots once we explained what a chatbot can do. But initially, it's like, oh, chatbots, you know, from all, group, all the focus groups. Because you think, you know, you call the bank, and you're online, and the chatbot doesn't respond to your questions. But then when they knew what it could do, they actually were like, wow, yeah, this could, be, this could work. So there were privacy concerns, um, especially among um, uh, black community members, uh, relatives of patients and patients. And so, of course, that's, trust is a huge issue. And so we were uh, reassured uh, that, and a little bit surprised that um, Rutgers University was a trusted source, not only of information, and that they trusted the Cancer Institute that we could um, uh, manage their uh, health information in a confidential uh, manner. That probably comes from more community engagement. We started a community uh, engagement outreach enterprise at uh, the Cancer Institute five, you know, about five years before, four years before these uh, focus groups. So community engagement helps at many levels, not only your research, but for a variety of reasons, uh, as you, many of you know. And so they gave us a lot of input into the chatbot uh, features. You'll see some of those features. 
We got um, uh, information about how to overcome uh, barriers, including uh, the trust, recognizing the historical treatment of black Americans. All my, um, I get that input from all um, of my uh, culturally, racially focused interventions. Uh, they wanted to know what um, the, ben the benefits of testing were, which people often do. And um, they gave us some information about their preferences. And then um, the chatbot, some specifics about the chatbot, which you'll hear, we incorporate uh, community input into the design of the interventions. And so we started building a, a non-culturally focused uh, chatbot that um, first focuses on uh, cancer patients. We can identify patients in the medical record. And it's, this is called the catalyst uh, study. So we used information from uh, the focus groups for uh, some of the studies I'm going to present uh, moving forward. And so the chatbot has a menu of options, uh, and then some are required. So the chatbot has uh, some onboarding where patients watch a video. So they, they learn information, um, basic information, and then there's patient testimonials. Community members, patients, they love testimonials, especially uh, <clears throat> if people, um, they can relate to the people that are in the videos. And then it can do a risk assessment. Uh, we're not using that for cancer patients, uh, making it required, because the risk assessment asks a lot about family history. So our chatbot can create a family pedigree. So uh, it's really cool. They love it. Uh, but the risk assessment can be quite lengthy. And we want patients to get the education. We want them to be able to ask questions, overcome any barriers. And those that want to get tested at the moment, the chatbot facilitates uh, testing. They can upload their insurance cards. We work with our uh, life center. Uh, which is, does our genetic counseling center, and they uh, will do some behind the scenes work getting insurance authorization. So we have a readiness ruler. Patients actually, most patients like this when they, we've tested it. It asks about the readiness for genetic testing. Why is genetic testing important to you, right? Gets them thinking. It uses a little motivational interview, and when we use health coaches, we use these rulers. Where are you in your decision to get testing? Oh, I'm thinking about it. Well, why are you, it's the rulers one to 10. Why are, you know, why are you this level and not this level? And then they, there's a little chat back and forth. So it really helps them process information. And then we send them um, an action letter and their genetic testing results if they get tested and a family communication letter that they can share the results with their family um, members. They can choose whether or not to use a voice chat or not. So it's text or voice. You can. You can change throughout the um, intervention. And this uh, pilot study mirrors Propel study, which I'll talk about the design. But this is just kind of what it looks like. Um, we got community input into the messaging. Uh, we're ready to start the pilot trial for this. Um, but we did a series of user usability testing. Patients generally say they like it, provided very neutral in information without being emotional, drama-free to the point it allows patients to start without having to wait two months to see their doctor, uh, who will then rush them through it or give the opposite response if you don't need that. It gives the patient a little more autonomy in decision making and um, pursuing uh, testing. They thought it was easy to navigate, used everyday language. I had a nice talk with uh, Chris this morning about um, literacy and comprehension. So we worked really hard so that we understood how people thought about the messaging and. They were, the community input really uh, helped a lot in that regard. Um, I found online information that can get confusing and send you in 20 directions. You all Google whenever I have a health problem. I Google and it sends me in 100 directions because I'm a researcher. And it's fairly simple information and helps make a decision. So we had numerous patients say, I'm wondering how long this platform is up and going. And if I, if I wanted to refer family members, like, is it going to be ready tomorrow? Because I want my friends and family member to see this. So this is a culturally uh, neutral um, intervention. Um, but we did find that um, in um, black patients, um, we had so, quite a few patients who made this comment on our Community Cancer Action Board when I was uh, ha engaging in dialogue, not presenting. It's bi-directional um, with them. Um, they said, wow, you know, this, this, this reduces some of the, um, you know, the bias I feel when I go to a clinic. You know, I'm not sure how that doctor really abuse me. This removes that, makes me more comfortable. I don't have to deal with that anxiety, right? Some of the symptoms of uh, systemic uh, racism. So 
Um, I'm not going to read through these, but we had lots of great comments. And then um, we uh, had applied for a UNITE grant, which was a really cool grant. Um, uh, Mark Schwartz, a longtime friend and collaborator, Lucille Adams Campbell, friend, and now finally we always said we have to work together. She's a co investigator on um, this study. It's per Propel, uh, Personalized Oncology, Promoting Equity for Black Lives. So this is a culturally tailored chatbot building on Catalyst. We did additional commu community engagement with black providers, black cancer patients, and uh, relatives of cancer patients to adapt the Catalyst uh, chatbot for specifically uh, for black uh, patients who suffer the most from disparities related to a lot of things, um, but in uh, genetic testing are less likely to uh, get a referral for genetic, clinical genetic services and are less likely uh, to be tested for a variety of reasons, multi-level like I showed you earlier. So the objective is to reduce uh, disparities, empower patients by increasing awareness and access and uptake of uh, testing. So the, the primary aim is to compare the efficacy of proactive outreach in the health system, which I'll get to in the next slide, plus streamlined genetic education and facilitated genetic testing uh, through the chatbot. It's an AI, artificial intelligence-based relational agent. We now call it based on community input, but in change of this, we call it a decision assistant uh, named Gita, Gita, uh, to, and we're comparing that to enhanced usual care. Uh, on outcomes, engagement with genetic education and testing, genetic testing uptake, and cascade uh, testing. And we're going to assess mediators like that slide I showed you, the diagram of how the intervention uh, worked or didn't work, um, and then explore uh, other um, moderators of interventions, such as uh, age, uh, gender, type of uh, cancer. So I mentioned what traceback uh, was previously. So we're using a traceback approach. These are not newly diagnosed cancer patients. We're using clinical informatics. So we have a large integrated health system at Rutgers. We just became uh, integrated in the past few years with um, RWJ Barnabas Health. We have over 14 uh, sites, uh, lots of uh, socioeconomic, racial, geographic uh, diversity, and uh, uh, Mark and Lucille are collaborating, who you know, are collaborating um, and we're recruiting patients from Georgetown MedStar. So we can go into, they use uh, PowerChart, we use Epic, Epic is a little more facile. Um, we use uh, Deep, if anybody's heard of Deep6, it's a strategy you can program in the EHR. We can I, use those NCCN criteria I showed you earlier. We're recruiting patients with a variety of cancers. They're all black patients, self-identify. They have to have, you know, meet the criteria if they have breast, colorectal, pancreas, endometrial, ovarian, and prostate cancer. So with the expanded criteria, there are loads of patients out there who haven't been tested in our um, health system. So the expanded criteria makes more patients eligible. Um, so we can identify the patients and then we can provide proactive outreach and contact them. So we're using our health systems, community outreach and engagement throughout. We have a study-specific community uh, advisory board that guides us uh, along the way. Uh, patients can then get genetic testing during either arm. The approach is different, which I'll show you in a schematic. And then ideally, uh, we're going to test at-risk. We're not testing at-risk relatives in this study. We're not funded to do that. Um, I wish we were. I wish our grants were bigger because we could do this. And we want to develop a, a, a family portal. So when we did our focus groups, uh, we talked a lot about how this family portal will work. So the patients, patients' relatives, with the patient's permission, can access the chatbot or digital assistant and get the report, even get the report to the genetic information and watch the videos. And then if they want, if they, there's a pathogenic variant in the family, they can go through the whole process, the educational empowerment process, and get genetic testing. So uh, we hope we can um, apply for a grant, get funding uh, to do this in a timely uh, fashion. It's pretty sad how the NIH budget and other budgets are uh, these days and worrisome, but we have, we're tenacious and we're going to uh, try to make this happen. So um, who is eligible? This is a slide I, I crafted because I, I need to speak with all the uh, physicians, surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists. So I've started doing that process, raising awareness about 
Catalyst, which is starting at the same time, and this is an at-large NIH trial where we're recruiting close to 500 uh, patients. Um, and so patients need to be six or more months past their diagnosis, so they're not, um, for the most part, um, you know, starting their uh, cancer uh, treatment. We're going to start identifying patients who've been seen in our healthcare settings, which are large, uh, multiple sites, clinic sites, but all in our integrated health systems, and then um, go out two years because we're more likely to reach them, right? Because addresses change, it's hard to find patients. Then we'd have to go into search, LexisNexis search services, and that can be uh, trying, especially with li a limited budget. And so they have to meet current guidelines, and they can't, cannot have a prior uh, uh, testing. So patients uh, get complete three surveys, a baseline survey one month, so we can assess for mediators, and then at six months. And then we do a, a medical record abstraction, and then our genetic, because our chatbot uh, facilitates testing, we know in that arm who, who, used, who got tested through our mechanism, but we have access to the electronic health records. And that, by the way, was no easy feat um, because you know, you're dealing with lawyers at uh, institutions, especially with the new, newly integrated health system in New Jersey. Um, but we're patting ourselves on the back because we made it. Um, and so we can do more, more interventions and get more people the services uh, that they need because they've been missed or underserved by the health system. So the pa patients get compensated. Compensation is important. Um, and then we give an extra bonus if they complete all three surveys because when you do clinical trials, you'd like to get, uh, those of us don't like missing data. And uh, they're, again, they get randomized to enhanced usual care. I didn't mention what usual care was. They get <clears throat> what the enhancement is. They receive, those in that arm get a clinical letter. So they get a clinical letter from a, a medical oncologist at each site, Claudia and Isaacs at Georgetown, MedStar, and then Debbie, Debbie Topmeyer here at, or in New Jersey. And they, the letter states that they um, uh, uh, are at increased risk, not in these terms, but basically they meet the criteria uh, for a genetic uh, risk assessment, and they're provided with information how to access it. E you know, through the web or the, the phone. So um, it's a low intensity intervention, but they are informed of, um, briefly informed about the risk from a, a medical uh, professional. And we also t tell them in the letter that their, their doctor supports the study. We know the doctors support the study because to recruit the patients to the study, we identify them. We then send a, a, le a letter with a list of potentially eligible patients to the physician. And then the oncologist needs to let us know whether or not to contact the patient. For example, patient could be in hospice, totally inappropriate. Patient could have dementia, oh no, no totally inappropriate. So they, they do endorse the study. And then um, the patients who get uh, GITA or GITA um, also get the clinical letter, but in the clinical letter there's a link to the digital assistant, the chatbot. And then they're, um, they can engage with the chatbot. And so this is a study uh, schematic. We identify patients. Uh, we consent them, go through the process of physician kind of approval, randomize them. Patients can make a decision to choose genetic testing or decline. In the, R in the um, we, we used to call it relational system. I still have to change that. Digital assistant arm. Uh, if they don't have a pathogenic variant or a mutation or have a variant of unknown significance, uh, they can get the information about their test results uh, from GITA, the chatbot, who then um, will, will show a video of what the test results mean, and then there's some back and forth chat. So I mentioned it was artificial intelligence enabled. Um, so we do have some questions, frequently asked questions that are structured questions. We provide the answers. Patients love that, because many of them tell us in the usability testing, we would have never thought about those questions. We love clicking on them because you're giving us ideas what questions to ask. And then we have the um, chatbot, which is uh, open-ended questions. And it's not, um, it's using a structured knowledge base. So we provide the knowledge base, it's a generative model, with credible information from credible sources. So it's not like chat GPT, where the chatbot is getting information just from anywhere. It could be you know, misinformation. So that's how we avoid that concern. Um, and then um, if their patients in both arms get a positive result, so pathogenic variant, uh, then they're referred to a genetic counselor to disclose the results. We've had a lot of dialogue, some disagreement. You know, with the uh, Cures Act, patients have a right to their information. So um, 
some of us are proponents of giving, giving the genetic test results via the chatbot. So I'd love your thoughts about that versus having them to wait for a genetic counselor when we know that they can go to the lab website in Vitae we're using and get their genetic test results. So uh, the other arm, the enhanced usual care, they, get, they, ne they need to uh, get the results by the genetic counseling um, centers because that's standard uh, practice. So that's an end another appointment. So one, free test genetic counseling, you already heard that's a barrier, and then um, post-test counseling. Can be done via telephone, they don't have to go to the clinic, telephone or, or televideo, telehealth. So these are just some pictures, snapshots I took of what um, GEDA looks like. This is uh, the, the top video in the middle is the uh, introductory video, Dana's the medical oncologist, and then the patient is wearing the purple turtleneck. The screen moves around so you can see faces of both and they're having a conversation. So Dana is telling, um, talking to the patient about um, hereditary cancer risk. It's an educational video and um, genetic testing, the benefits, um, et cetera. And then on the bottom, there's uh, testimonials, patient testimonials. So we have patients with a variety of diseases uh, and situations. And so those are um, you know, very favorably uh, view, reviewed as well. And then um, the chatbot. So there's questions in the middle on the right hand side of the slide show um, the facts, the frequently, frequently asked questions that are pre populated uh, answers. And then this just has some more. They're, we're asking the patient about their genetic testing decision, and then we guide them through the decision whether if they want testing, then they're guided to in, you know, upload their insurance, uh, insurance card, or if they have difficulty, digitally challenged. Uh, most patients, even um, older patients, are able to use uh, the chatbot. And so we do facilitate uh, access to computers if patients don't have um, access to computers. But most people have digital phones uh, and access to the web. So this can be used on a tablet, computer, or uh, iPhone. And so you just get to see, like, and then um, patients love question prompts. And I have a nursing background. I already knew this. Um, but they love when you give them questions to ask their doctor because they didn't think about them. And so they, you know, we gave them commonly um, asked questions and our community engagement approach helped us with that. And then they can um, write notes, put notes in there for other questions. And so we did usability testing. Uh, we just completed that. We're ready to start the trial uh, in May. Um, we have some revisions, so community engagement involves responding to community identified needs and suggestions, so it's an iterative process. So we just finished that. We're making, um, collating all the information and suggestions, and then we work with our vendor, which is uh, Bots Crew. They've developed chatbots for um, in other, other uh, settings, and so they've been great to work with. So uh, one, one male said if people knew about it, they would do the test. He didn't know about it. Uh, there's nothing I'm going to add to it. Jita did well. It's very understandable. The steps she takes you through, very simple to navigate. This was something I enjoyed. I'm happy I did it. Like I said, it was very informative. It opened my eyes to things I didn't know as far as I like, you know, testing. Another thing that was helpful was the questions that you guys listed in the PDF that you would talk to your doctor. It would be great to take along, just something to take to the doctor with you. Got lots of information, lots of uh, feedback that they learned a lot. I like it. It's very self-explanatory, easy to follow. So they felt it was easy to navigate. Uh, we worked really hard on that. There were a lot of iterations uh, related to that internally, even before we got to the usability uh, testing. But then we got more in, more input, and uh, my questions are being answered, and even some new questions I didn't think of are being answered. It really engulfs you into this opportunity to understand genetic testing. The chatbot has an ease to it. The time is in your hands as, as to how fast you want to go. We heard, heard that a lot. They like doing it at their own pace. They don't have to feel anxious at a clinic. Kind of pushing information out in a busy clinic. And they like the family communication letter. They thought it was a great resource because they can just give it to their family members without figuring out how to tell them and explain the genetic test results. And see, that's why the family portal would be so great because then the family members Family, if one who is tested, can refer the family members to the portal, and then they get all the educational videos that are tailored to them, right? Because they're not the cancer patient necessarily. Then I'm going to briefly mention um, Project Pinpoint. I know I'm out of time. 
Uh, I'll refer to your publication. I think it was in this year in the journal. Uh, cancer, we were funded through an equity initiative uh, by the American Cancer Society who partnered with Pfizer uh, Global. Uh, Project Pinpoint, promoting informed approaches in precision oncology and immunotherapy. So when I moved to New Jersey, I started the Cancer Center's first uh, community advisory board, which we call the Cancer uh, uh, <clears throat> Cancer Action uh, community, cancer, community Cancer Action Board. So we wanted action in there because those of you who know me I like action. I'm just talking, although I like to talk a lot, as you can see. Um, so Pinpoint um, uh, addresses disparities uh, in black racial disparities. Black patients are less likely uh, to uh, get tumor sequencing. Sequencing gen gen se genomic sequencing of the tumor uh, guides precision oncology, which has been a game changer in oncology and cancer treatment. So Molecularly targeted therapies and immune therapy can help um, more patients get into uh, remission and survive uh, longer. It's too, 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 too early to look at cure rates at this point um, for long-term long outcomes. So we know there's a suboptimal diversity in clinical trials. Uh, minorities, black patients are underrepresented. Huge issue. We can't draw meaningful conclusions. Uh, when I wrote uh, this grant, I, you know, I wasn't surprised because I'm in the disparities realm that, you know, there were, of all the, pa the molecularly targeted immune therapy trials we were looking at, very few black patients were in those trials. So we added a clinical trials module to this uh, intervention because many of these targeted therapies are begin being combined with immune therapy and other therapies. So um, that was important for this. So we know that black patients have higher cancer mortality rates, less likely to have tumor testing, wait longer for novel treatments, and don't have access. Our CAB, Cancer Center-wide, identified uh, racial disparities in access to uh, novel uh, cancer treatments and genetic testing as community-identified priorities, they told us. So we aim to um, use a community-engaged approach to co-create this digital intervention to empower uh, uh, patients and in, improve uh, access to uh, uh, novel uh, therapies, molecularly targeted therapies. Again, you need to have tumor sequence to get to the level, to get the treatment. And then we, we did a lot of um, community engagement. We uh, engaged with black providers, uh, patients, cancer patients, and some um, significant others. Significant others are off, often involved in the treatment uh, decision making, so we wanted to get their opinions. And then we did a small pilot uh, randomized trial. We hope to take this trial to a larger level, uh, be speaking with uh, one of the NCORP groups, the National Clinical Oncology Research Program, which is a, co a cooperative clinical trials group. Most cancer patients get cancer treatment in community settings, not academic centers. And this allows patients to stay in their own communities and get access to clinical trials, not only treatment, but trials such as this, cancer control trials. So we, I have a lot of some befores and afters I don't have to show you, but we did a lot of um, uh, maybe superficial tailoring, which is uh, graphics and pictures, and then deep tailoring messaging. Um, iterative process uh, along the way. Uh, we have a chatbot in this. Um, the chatbot initially was uh, optional, but in doing our usability testing was most famous, one of the most favorite features of the chatbot. It wasn't AI enabled. We didn't, we, we, weren't funded, it cost money, we made more money to do the AI stuff, uh, but it had pre-populated questions. And they really liked the interactivity, um, liked uh, um, a, lot of, a lot about it. Clinical trials model, module, we got lots of input on uh, messaging and how representation uh, matters and how to say that, how to address distrust. We used some of the videos that I've used in other research and for our cancer center on clinical trials. Um, uh, focused on um, black uh, patients and community members since there's unique uh, issues. And then we had a quiz in there. Patients like the interactivity of the quiz because it broke up some of the, the text, as you can imagine, complex information. Uh, here's uh, some of the, uh, the videos from um, patients. Again, some of them are drawn on other community outreach or research projects. And then again, questions for your doctor. They love it. Love, love, love. Um, and then we provide a resource module. So in our uh, GEDA chatbot for genetic testing, and this we included resources because patients do like to be able to know where, to, where else to go without having to search a website and getting 20 to 100 uh, resources that they can get through. Patients really, we had a lot of favorable feedback for the sake of time, I won't um, mention it. It's in the paper. We have a lot of exemplar 
uh, quotes. They really appreciated uh, addressing um, uh, sensitive racial issues, including um, acknowledging Tuskegee. That's important. We've learned that for clinical trials. Uh, just enrollments, I work with the clinical trials office and my team, I have a great team, um, for uh, messaging and uh, activities um, to uh, educate uh, the public. So what did our research show? So our, our single arm trial uh, showed that um, we increase knowledge about clinical trials and, dis and precision oncology. So we assess knowledge. Uh, it was Chris, I loved you, uh, meeting with you this morning thinking more about comprehension. We did have some uh, knowledge uh, questions. And then we increase decision-making capacity regarding tumor sequencing and precision oncology treatment. So uh, we felt uh, that uh, that community engagement really helped make this intervention a success for the target population. I'd like to acknowledge many people uh, who were involved in all of this uh, research. I can take questions. <clears throat> Great, I will start out. Um, I am really interested in some of the initial testing you did on the chat bot and whether you were seeing, you know, I know it's not a lot of people, but whether you see any patterns and whether folks use that chat bot differently or have, are interested in, in sort of gaining different things from those conversations or whether you'll be able to sort of look at that in the future. That's a, um, that's a great question. I don't think we can, we've analyzed the data for that purpose because we weren't set out to do then, you know, we have grants and we're on a timeline too. <laughs> um, be happy to talk to you later. We're meeting later about how to do that, and maybe we could uh, collaborate on that. I'm also curious with the chat bot, and I know you're just starting out on the new project, but issues of difference by age and satisfaction with the chat bot? Yeah, so um, we're just starting now, you know, because the, the catalyst is in the pilot phase. That's culturally neutral, and then the culturally tailored propel. Um, we, with Pinpoint, we did see, you know, maybe older cancer, so there were older cancer patients who, um, and many, most of those, I don't know if it was age or like poverty, you know, other issues, literacy, um, you know, I have to train my staff, um, being a former clinician I knew, um, you know, there are still people who can't read and write, and so there's, there's myriad issues, and it's hard to discern that you know, in the settings, but we had some patients that, um, just, a, just a few, like a, maybe two um, come to mind where they had difficulty with the intervention. One, after uh, probing my staff, I think the person um, had liter general literacy issues, okay? The other had, um, uh, was older um, and had some difficulty using um, the pinpoint um, chat because there was more going on, on there. It wasn't just a chat bot, it was an optional chat bot. But once they got into the chat bot, they could use that. And then in the usability testing we just completed, age didn't seem to matter. Um, we, in the pinpoint study, I had my staff help patients if they didn't, if they couldn't use the chat. But in this larger study, the Propel project, we, um, patients need to have some computer literacy to use it because that's what it's meant for, right? Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll track that, who, who's excluded and who has problems. My staff are trained, or Mark's staff, are trained to um, address questions, you know, technical um, issues. But, you know, we're testing a digital intervention, so if we include people where we have to send research staff, let's say Newark is one area, we have a lot of patients under, from underserved communities, and my patients get, you know, my staff need to get on a train and get, get there and go there. It's not practical, right? Because that's, that, that, that doesn't happen in the real world. So we refer them to libraries, we refer them to their significant others who can help, help them through the chat. We have one um, male patient who was doing usability testing and he asked if his um, uh, daughter could uh, be with him at the time. And so we allow for that because that can help them navigate the system. What do you think about um, giving um, positive genetic test results um, through the chatbot if patients can already access it? See, when patients access, access the genetic test results that they have a mutation, a pathogenic variant on a genetic 
website, all they get is the report. Whereas if they can get access it also through the chatbot if they choose, they get a video that tells them what it means and what the next steps are. I know it's controversial, but I'd love, if anybody has opinions, you can email me if you're too shy to say, because it's a controversial issue. I think that there's a long history of thinking that people will be more um, uh, upset about that issue. Yes. So it feels like to me that a, your main resistance may come from providers who have an interest in being part of that process. Genetic Maybe. counselors. Yeah. 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 Or, or, or physicians, yeah. as we've seen with, yeah. 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 Um, I actually have another question, which is you are obviously very cancer focused. Have you ever thought about adapting your tools here to different conditions? Because we talked about autism this morning and genetic testing. It occurred to me that a number of what you're doing could be adapted to a different condition. Have you thought about those at all? Yeah. So um, not outside of cancer because I'm so focused on cancer, but I'd be willing to collaborate with somebody who wants to adapt, adapt our in tools for other conditions. Um, for example, I have a lung cancer screening trial. So we're using, um, it's in Rutgers, RWJ Barnabas Health System, which includes over 80 clinic sites, primary care sites, over 300 providers and millions of patients. And so we are identifying patients who are eligible for lung cancer screening. It relies on tobacco history. Tobacco history for determining eligibility for screening is poorly captured in the EHR. So we identify anybody who's a prior or past smoker and then our staff. Um, I also have community navigators that do something similar for other screening. So it could be, it's really translatable, but we have um, staff call them for eligibility because it's a research study and ask them about their tobacco history so we can capture whether or not they're eligible. And then they get randomized uh, to two, two arms and the intervention arm is a decision coaching arm uh, done by access navigators, supervised by nurse navigators in the health system. I'll tell telehealth, and that's a conversation with the navigator. And then the patient, if they want screening, the navigator then helps them access screening. If a nodule is complicated, lung cancer screening with the nodules and nodule clinics, uh, then they need to get diagnosis, you know, diagnostic workup, or at least a workup of the nodule. Then the nurse navigator then intervenes because then it becomes like, you know, cancer workup, and then navigates them uh, to care. But a lot of the, the intervention, I think, could be done um, as we learn more about um, digital interventions and chatbots. People like the conversation. They like being able to ask questions. They like the, pre and they love the videos and testimonials. A lot of it, because we, you know, we, we engage community, they told us. And this could be, you know, save the access navigator some time, and maybe a little bit better, because, you know, the access navigators vary in how they uh, relay the information. Right, because their their navigators are not you know trained health coaches. So I think we could uh, the next step would be to take some of the stuff we're learning from um, the chatbot and uh, use that to get more people screened, not just for lung cancer, and then have navigation behind the scenes. Are you interested in lung screening? Because we don't force tests or genetic testing or anything on patients. Right, it's a process. And then if they do, they're interested, then we send messages, talk to your doctor, but also then would have a navigator. Can we, oh, would you like to talk to somebody, you know, before you go to your doctor or after? And then we get the navigator to call them. So we could do that with other types of cancer screening. We could do it with HPV vaccination, especially, with, you know, training the younger generation on HPV vaccination. We have a lot of work to do in that area as well. Yes? Uh, I was wondering if you could expand more on the community research board that you, is it in New Jersey that you created, kind of the recruitment process for that, the training process, and how you feel like having that community board has impacted the research you've done. Yeah, it's not only the research I've done, the beauty of it, it's impacted uh, my colleagues' uh, research. So the community, I have a study-specific community advisory board for all of, most of my trials, especially working with underserved populations. So that's study-specific. And then the community, and they provide you know, in, before the grant's written, they'll, and then when the grant, we get the grant, intervention development, we, we let them know what our community engagement research shows, right, the qualitative stuff, and they're with us all the way in developing the inter intervention and evaluating. Community Cancer Action Board is cancer center-wide, so um, we're one of the most uh, 
racially, ethnically, socioeconomically diverse states in the nation, so we need to pay attention to representation, and uh, so we have a diverse um, uh, board uh, representing um, segments of the population. Uh, they get onboarded, they learn about you know, the cancer center. Many of them are patient advocates, they're interested because they are involved in cancer in some way. They could be a, like, we like to have a you know, primary care provider letting us know what some of the issues are in the, the care world. And then we have all walks of life, socioeconomic status. I don't want people that are the worried white wealthy well. <laughs> you know? um, so we have uh, good, I think, good representation in our community to, would tell you. We can't have a 100 member advisory board, right? We started, we grew it, and there were about 36 members, but that was a little too big. So what we did was we have this board, they provide input into um, the cancer center-wide strategic plan, our community outreach logic model. They provide uh, input into um, initiatives. It could be, let's say, a biospecimen initiative or a human pathology resource. We need to increase diversity, so I bring them, you know, the, the leaders in, and they get input from the community. Um, we bring researchers in, right? It's a researcher, um, even basic scientist. Uh, we've had to train or coach. Uh, especially the basic scientists, but a lot of my colleagues that are population scientists, they throw up like GIS maps that are not understandable to the average person and, you know, gels and sequencing results. So we have to coach them to talk in terms of, um, you know, the patient, the lay patient, can, the lay public can understand. We also have to um, uh, coach them in asking what questions they ask, because the reason they're there is to engage in dialogue, not to have a, a unilateral presentation. It's a Dialogue, so that's that's been a hard concept actually to get across. Many um, scientists, you probably aren't surprised. And then they, we um, that became really popular. We don't have enough time at our cab meetings to bring everybody in who now wants to do it. Every every person who's met with our cab has said that was great. I want to come back, and they actually um, zoom in on the cab meetings. Then we started uh, at Rutgers. We were the first uh, group to start a community uh, scientist program. It was called Citizen Scientist at the time. And then my friend and colleague, Rob Wynn, and I were at an airport. We have a lot of deep conversations about disparities and other issues. And he said one, one, of, one of his um, uh, cab members, they were, they were thinking about a citizen scientist program, and they said, well, I'm not a citizen, right? I'm not a citizen of the United States. Can I, can I be involved? So, you know, that's morphed into community uh, scientist. So we train them. We, train, we have a whole... Um, uh, module that's spaced out over 15 weeks, short, self-paced. There's some didactic that they come together, and then they get um, hands-on training. They review our pilot grants. So all of our Cancer Health Equity Center pilot grants are reviewed by scientists and then also community uh, uh, members. And then now it's become so popular, and even the basic scientist initiatives, I'm trying to you know, generate more disparities research, even basic science, are asking for community engagement. So before the grants are submitted or when their grants are submitted, they need a patient advocate. We actually uh, find them um, advocates. So it's not just the board. It's a lot of the board members have tr been trained as community scientists, and then they lead what we have now is impact councils, right? Because we can't grow a 100-member board, but people want to be involved. So we'll take people who want to be involved, regardless of who they are, and they can choose what impact council, the community scientist impact council, so I'm thinking of starting a community scientist institute, making it even more important, right? Uh, raise the bar a little bit. So th those are just some examples. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much.